My name is Virginia Trimble. I'm professor of physics and astronomy at the University of California, Irvine, now the oldest member of the department still on active duty. <laughs> okay. um, I'm an honorary staff member at, of the observatory in Japan at Boskupi in Poland, the Queen Jadwiga Observatory. And what are you an expert in? Um, I'm a magpie. I run around picking up little glittery facts and putting them together. <laughs> and Helga Krog, who's a serious historian, says that's the first thing you need to do if you're going to be a historian of science, but it's not the whole story. <laughs> the pattern you put your, your glittery things into also matters. Do you have any favorite music? Uh, anything sung by Enrico Caruso. Caruso. Yes. All right. How, how about books? Favorite books? Authors? Uh, it depends on, well, if I could have only, only one author, it might well be Agatha Christie because she wrote so many books. Um, at the moment, I'm just reading Wolf Hall. I'd already read the middle book of the trilogy. This is about Cromwell. Oh. But like many girls of my generation, I was very fond of Anne Boleyn and sorry when she was executed. I, I remember it well. I told you I was very old. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So I know the story. So it didn't matter that I read the middle volume first, but I'm now reading the first volume of the Cromwell trilogy. And uh, when you're not thinking about Are We Alone, what do you think about? What do I think about? Breakfast quite often. <laughs> <laughs> um, I breakfast, mean, I, I mean, what do you have for breakfast? What did I have for breakfast? Not much choice. It was an egg salad sandwich and a fruit cup from Starbucks. Uh, the, the hotel right. doesn't run to good early breakfast. All right. And uh, are we alone? Um, depends on what you want for company. All right. If you want slime molds, even biologists who are rather tiresome about these things like Ernst Meyer who received his PhD on his 21st birthday, incidentally. Oh, this wow. doesn't that, happen anymore. That's early. Um, he, he could have had his first legal drink to celebrate his, birth, his uh, PhD. Anyway, um, slime molds are probably fairly common. That is to say, self-reproducing, very simple, single-celled, maybe not even cells, but self-reproducing things made of organic molecules. The, the chemistry is pretty obvious chemistry. Whether you get intelligence very often is quite a different question. And one of my favorites is, what if the, the Cretaceous tertiary disaster hadn't happened, that big impact, about 65 million years ago? There was a dinosaur named Stenonychosaurus. Stenoc he stood about two meters high. He had a three-fingered hand with a posable thumb and was intelligent enough you could have taught him to bring the newspaper and answer to his name. And if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out, he might, he, she, they might have evolved into more intelligent creatures. And Dale Russell has a wonderful picture. No, it's Simon Conway Morris in Cambridge. Has a picture that shows a degree granting ceremony in Cambridge where they're all dinosaurs. <laughs> so um, it's, we are unique on Earth. But part of that, well, maybe all of it, is these random events, some good, some bad, and some other mix of random events both good and bad in terms of climate and disasters and various kinds might have led to a very different sort of dominant organism. Um, about the slime mold, now slime molds are eukaryotes, so they're fairly uh, advanced in terms well, of microbes. Well, okay, fair enough. Uh, I, I pick slime molds because they're so revolting. They make, <laughs> these, they make these beautiful stratified layer rocks, mm -hmm. called something, I don't remember. Stromatolites. Stromat yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but when you find one in your bathroom, it is so revolting. I see. <laughs> Have you found a slime mold in your bathroom? Well, if you aren't careful, you do get biological films growing uh -huh. in places that are warm and wet and where there's skin flakes off of the shower provides food for these things. So, yeah, probably. So if I hear you correctly, you're saying that uh, we're not quite sure if we're alone, but we probably aren't, and it's probably the slime molds or microbes that are out there, and whether that's intelligent life or not, that's a bigger issue, or? Well, is you need a much larger sample of hab habitable planets uh, if you want to be reasonably sure of finding evolution that was a bit like ours, because there were so many random events. And you have to ask, of course, are we alone on what distant scale? We, I think, are reasonably certain nothing else in the solar system is inhabited. Though, you know, William Herschel would have said he'd seen trees on the moon. Mm -hmm. He wrote to the Astronomer Royal at the time saying he'd seen trees on the moon. Um, and other people, many of them over centuries, have thought that Mars and perhaps Venus would have intelligent creatures. It's given rise to some wonderful science fiction, but it turns out not to be true. Well, there's a Russian scientist here who has a poster that says he has good evidence for life on Venus, I think. Okay. Um, 
There is another colleague here who's Professor Emeritus at Cal State Fullerton who is very sure that the diffuse interstellar bands are very complex organic molecules in space. Uh -huh. All right. He had a splinter session yesterday, which I didn't get to because I was in other things, and I suspect it was not well attended. That doesn't mean he's wrong. It's just most people don't think he's right. One, argu one argument against the idea that human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution is uh, Australia, in the sense that it's been a, a, it's an independent experiment in evolution for about 90 million years, and it doesn't seem that kangaroos have gotten any smarter or any other mammalian landlocked creature has gotten smarter during that time period. Now, 90 million years is quite a long time, and... Well, it's not such a long time. You know, it's, it's a few percent of the time it take, has taken life on Earth to develop. Um, but it's about... Kangaroos, I'd have to think about. Um, but it's about 30 times longer than the time it took our brains to triple in size to well, make okay, us... Well, okay, fair enough. Um, and it wasn't inhabited by nasty people for most of those 90 that's million right, years. That's right, right. On the other hand, the kangaroo is not a particularly successful design. In general, the monotremes and the marsupials are not, which is why they've only hung out in places like South America and Australia. Oh, so you're a placental chauvinist. Oh, absolutely. Well, shouldn't women be placental chauvinists? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All I mean, anything that provides more nutrition to the infant is likely to be a good choice mm -hmm. if you want to develop. Well, intelligence takes time, not just evolutionary time but time for infants to be looked after. And no kangaroo has learned to look after its infant for more than a couple of months. So, so let me get this straight. Uh, when I, let me ask you again, are we alone? Um, if you take the whole universe and multiverse, probably not. If you want our corner of the Milky Way, probably yes. Or the Fermi question wouldn't, wouldn't have been asked. We would know where they were. Oh, so you think the Fermi paradox is a, I mean, do you have a favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? That you, you imply that the, your favorite solution is, well, lo, the emergence of life is so rare that they're not nearby. Is that The emergence of intelligence, manipulative abilities, um, whatever else it has distinguished us and enabled us to develop technology, that might well be rare. I mean, my favorite answer when I used to talk about this a lot was that about the time a species learns to manipulate its planet, it blows itself to smithereens mm -hmm. or drowns in its own garbage. So of the things in the Drake equation, it's the lifetime L of a communicating civilization that might be very short. So, so that would be in agreement with Frank Drake's uh, N equals L equation that he has on his uh, license well, plate. Does he? I, I, oh, yes, I, I guess I knew that. Um, he, started, he started the wrong way. He started with star formation. You don't want to do that. You want to start with the existing stars. But if you modify his equation for that, then L is certainly as uncertain as anything in that equation. We, we now know there are planets. When he first thought about these issues, we didn't even know that there were planets. Right. So self-destruction, you said, by, by either blowing yourself to smithereens or drowning in your, your own, own garbage. garbage. Well, I mean, these are somewhat metaphorical, but not entirely. There is still nuclear war possible. Uh -huh. Maybe prob probable. I don't know. I think the, uh, the clock the bulletin of the atomic scientist that always says it's two minutes to midnight, I think that's too pessimistic. Okay. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Yuri Milner, an internet billionaire, donated uh, or yes, dedicated $100 million to... Breakthrough's the, Listening. Breakthrough's Listening, right. Yes. So what do you think of that? Um, he has the money to spare. He's entitled to use it for what he wants. It would not necessarily have been my choice, even for science, let alone thinking about potable water for the poor in sub-Saharan Africa. But it's his money, he has a choice. It's not an infinite amount when you think of it's going to be over a period of a decade or more. It will bring back probably some of the radio searches and an optical search that may be better aimed than the one from the SETI Institute was, which focused, well, I don't know what I think, but Greg Benford thinks it's focused far too much on nearby stars. You should be looking at the galactic bulge uh -huh. as a unit because that's where the old high metallicity stars are. And the best chance to have had time and the raw materials for complex organic molecules to turn into politicians or whatever you, mm -hmm. whatever you want. But uh, there's, there's an issue here when you talk about intelligence and human-like intelligence. A biologist, Ernst Meyer, for example, would say that human-like intelligence is a species-specific characteristic and like all species, it's unique, and we should not think of it as mm -hmm. in a statistical way like physicists are used to thinking about things. Well, For example, 
what's the probability of English re-evolving or coming back? Oh, zero, of course. But um, by intelligence, you know, I don't mean the quartets of Mozart or the plays of Shakespeare. I mean radio astronomy. Mm -hmm. And any civilization that starts out poor and gradually develops resources and wants to communicate will almost certainly go through a radio phase. But you're limiting, on Earth at least, among the millions and millions of species, you're talking about one. Yes, right? but and we wouldn't let anybody else do it. Well, but that, so you're saying that we were the first and we suppressed others, but well, example. Well, that's clearly true for other hominids. But it's so clearly forth. not true for a place like Australia and Madagascar and South America, where these species had long periods. Yes, and again, they were the, um, they were the marsupials and the monotremes. <laughs> All right, so you say, once you get placentals, well again, well then we could go back about, oh, about 300 million years and say, okay, there was, being a placental mammal is a species-specific characteristic because there was only one proto- Oh, I don't mean you necessarily need, I'm only talking about Earth not having developed other communicating species. I mean, dolphins are probably very smart, but if you live under the water, where do you keep your car keys? <laughs> okay, yes, um, where do you keep, or, or where do you keep your cars? <laughs> yeah, well, that, people lose their car keys even on, on, on land. Okay. Um, but what I, what I mean by manipulative isn't necessarily human or humanoid, but the ability to use your environment as much as it will let you use it. There are these three stages of civilization, of course, one that uses its whole planet, one uses its whole solar system, and one uses its whole galaxy. If there were others of classes two and three, we would probably know about them, at least if there were a lot of them. Uh -huh. the, the class two would simply look like an infrared variable star. And there are a lot of those, but none of them is very interesting looking apart from being a young star with lots of dust around it. But as far as I know, very little effort has gone into locating these infrared objects that would be anomalous and therefore indications of an entire sol uh, stellar system civilization. Certainly not nearly as much as it's gone into a Drake-type radio search. I mean, there, people have looked, but uh, not at the same level. I don't know whether I would want to do it or not. I was almost in a job where it would have been one of my jobs uh -huh. at U.S. Naval Observatory after they'd done the two micron survey. Uh, I almost took that job. <laughs> Glad I didn't. <laughs> now, if we're not sure that there's life or intelligent life out there, we're doing a little bit about it. We're doing like SETI searches and we're going to start to try to look for biosignatures on Earth-like planets and habitable zones. Yeah, I mean, if you see coexistence of ozone and CH4, you've got complicated chemistry. Maybe not biological, but complicated chemistry. Um, all right, uh, but is there any way that you could suggest to improve this search to, to scientifically uh, reduce the uncertainty? I hadn't thought about that in advance. Um, other people say, yes, there are manipulative, intelligent things out there. They're almost certainly machines and we would not recognize them. I'm not even sure that's true. It may well be that once there are robots and machines that have characteristics that we don't, they want to cre recreate biological life because they find it emotionally interesting, for instance. For example, like we are recreating, we're genetically engineering microbes to do our, what we would like. Well, no, I was thinking more about improved pets. Improved pets, okay. <laughs> so I can mean, you make a smart dog or something? Or I don't like dogs. Uh, um, cats. Then. Cat, yes, a, a cat. A cat that would be easier to herd than astronomers. <laughs> I see. Okay. Actually, you know, it's, it's not true that a, an astronomy committee is like herding cats. It's like herding pyramids. You I shove them, they don't move. Um, the, the, the robots would move when they were shoved if they wanted to. But um, I can imagine recreation of biological organisms, much improved biological organisms. And that's, that's another direction to go is, is uh, human machine melds that can do things that neither can do alone. So I asked uh, Martin Rees about the, you know, his belief that uh, biological creatures will almost inevitably turn into what he called inorganic life, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, wa I wanted to ask him what would come after that. And you think, well, these inorganic things would recreate what they used to be. But also, might there be something, I mean, more abstract than inorganic life? I don't know. You could. Oh, sure. I mean, there, there's Fred Hoyle's cloud, where the energy source is magnetic reconnections, and the structures are complex plasma currents. How about something even wilder, like uh, I don't know, controlling vacuum fluctuations or something, cr creating patterns in the vacuum fluctuation? Yeah. That if there were a lot of it, again, we would know about it, I think. 
Well, th that can fluctuations we still don't understand them very well. We just called it noise, but often in the oh, past... You, when you know, if you mean proper vacuum fluctuations and people were patterning, um, the Casimir effect would vary from place to place. The lambda... Well, have we looked at the Casimir fluctuations in the Casimir effect, for example? We, or, or, for example, the lamb shift, right? Yeah, that was, that was the other one. I haven't, but that was one of the things that Joe used to do occasionally, casually. But if there were patterns in the noise, what we call now called noise or fluctuations, maybe well, that would be... I wouldn't have called it noise. I mean, if it's an effect you can measure and you get the same answer every time, it's not exactly noise. Well, it depends. For example, if somebody was listening to this conversation, they would say, oh, that's noise. I don't understand a word of that. That's just blah, 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 blah. Uh, no, they wouldn't. There are, there are simple algorithms that can distinguish language from nonsense. Uh -huh. I mean, even... <laughs> this isn't quite polite. Kind of, even, you can, even you do that. When you go to a foreign country and you hear people talking to each other, uh -huh. you immediately recognize that there's information in that, where if you hear little kids babbling at each other, you suspect that there is not. And you can do that without looking at them. You don't need to know they're little kids. The babbling is different. But do you think we've really applied such sophisticated algorithms to quantum fluctuations, lamb shift, Casimir effect? No, you could. you could. I mean, these days there are an awful lot of scientists looking for something to do. Uh -huh. <laughs> Even I'm involved in the slightly cockeyed project at the moment. So what's that? <laughs> um, the, you know, the value of capital G is not well determined. Uh -huh. G times the mass of the sun is very well known to 17 significant figures. Uh -huh. But capital G alone is measured on Earth with chunks of matter and the people who have done it over the past few decades only agree to about three significant figures. I see. And if you look at the published numbers, they vary periodically with a period of 5.9 years. Hmm. Measurements of the length of day also vary with a period of 5.9 years. It's half the solar cycle, and yeah. it may be something to do with I solar see. cycle. It could also be currents in the core of the Earth, the magnetic materials that give rise to the Earth's dipole are circulating right. the, iron, molten iron. And the iron. variation is a one sigma variation or uh, two If sigma? you do the statistics that our paper does, it's <laughs> about five sigma. Five sigma, that's a quite a large signal. Then. Yeah, that, that was what led to the guys trying to publish it and me being the referee and saying, have you thought of the solar cycle? And they said, well, come on board as the fourth author. <laughs> <laughs> How about the idea of uh, either multiverses or extra dimensions. I mean, if you're, if we, if we stay alive for another ten thousand or a million years, presumably we might become good at manipulating or even visiting these other dimensions, or maybe, maybe, or leaking like gravity from one multiverse to another right. across could, a brain. Right. Could we create ourselves in gravitational waves and be transport ourselves Something. through into another? Is that? I possible? like the idea of, of multiverses generically, because the trend of history has definitely been every time somebody said, we're special and unique, and somebody else said, no, there are lots of others. The lots of others guys have been right. Uh -huh. Whether it was planets, or suns, or galaxies, or clusters, super clusters. Or even dimensions. <laughs> Lani Ake or whatever it's, yeah, Lani, Lani Ake. Um, why shouldn't it be true also for universes? Um, if you want more dimensions, you've got to keep them out of the way, because extra, um, macroscopic dimensions, you don't get any stable orbits. And you can't have a nicely warm place. Things go wandering. You also don't really want extra time dimensions. You have no causality. Wrapped up dimensions don't do that as long as they're smaller than you know the Planck length or uh -huh. something like that. So extra spatial dimensions you're okay with then? Well, I don't think you can rule them out with present data. I love the Hugh Everett multi-world concept partly because it's given rise to such neat science fiction, a lot of it by John Wyndham. Oh, uh -huh. I'm not aware of that. There's some short stories in which there are, you know, every time a particle decays or something, the universe splits, and you can sometimes creep across from one rib of the fan to the next one and encounter your counterparts and try to improve their lives and things like that. His stories all have happy endings, partly why I like the concept. But I, I, it's like reincarnation. Um, it's a lovely idea, I wish it were true, but I think it probably isn't. How about the idea of uh, micro or nano aliens? Maybe we haven't discovered, maybe they are here. Maybe one answer to the Fermi paradox is there are aliens everywhere and they've got little spaceships, but they are smaller than mm. uh, you well, know, a micron or something. Well, if they're going to be intelligent slash communicating, their sizes are set by the same physics that sets things here. And you can't have single particles talking to each other in any useful fashion. 
Could you have assemblages of single particles? Maybe. Well, there's a lot of room at the bottom, as Feynman said. Well, yes and no, but um, I'm not sure how he felt about Planck scale physics. He was not, I think, interested in it. Well, there's about 20 orders of magnitude between the micros, micron scale and, and uh, Planck scale. So. Point taken. But, you know, things like ants and termites really only work as assemblages. And they show something very much like intelligence as assemblages, but not as individuals. Uh, how about viruses? They're very small. They're probably the smallest yes, semi-living things we know about. Well, again, I, I can't imagine individual viruses doing radio astronomy. Uh -huh. I, I can't actually, viruses can't really live on their own. They need to infect somebody, preferably not us today. How about the idea of uh, what I call matryoshka aliens? That is, we're inside of an alien. We're yeah. part of a cell or something, and we don't even know it. Like the neurons and in your brain do not know they're part of your brain. Um, are you sure of that? I'm not sure of that, but I uh, And I don't I instantly well. know how to, how to measure it. Um, do you mean us as individuals, or do you mean, say, the solar system? I mean the whole universe. Could the whole be, oh, OK. If, we, um, if it started from a quantum fluctuation, that, that's really small. And okay. so if we're okay. quantum fluctuation um, inside of some larger thing. OK. I mean, that's, that's another version of, of bubbled inflation, where one bubble can expand into another. Yes. I think it's not expected to happen very often, but I don't think it's impossible. So Matryoshka uh, aliens is a poss possibility. Possibly. Um, one of the questions about these bubble inflations is if you see, if you're near where one is starting, can you throw information forward into it? And if one bubbles out inside yours, it seems like that's a better chance. And so if we were inside another bubble, it would not be totally unreasonable to look for something, maybe information co encoded in DNA, which people have thought about before, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, that is a message from the larger universe that we are inside of. Okay, and uh, now let's, let's try to come back to the idea of improving on current searches for aliens. One is SETI for looking for intelligence. Mm -hmm. One are these planetary people looking at the atmospheres. Hopefully in a decade or two, we'll be able to look at the atmospheres of terrestrial-like planets and the yep. habitable zones yes. and maybe- yep. If the world try survives, yeah. Try to, if the world survives. <laughs> Do you think the world will survive? Well, and it isn't just the atmospheres, of course. If you can separate out the light, you can do what we do with Earthshine. You can look at the broadband colors and see oceans and continents and the red edge that is chlorophyll and useful molecules for photosynthesis. We see those in Earthshine. There's quite a literature on, well, not quite, a small literature on whether chlorophyll will, will be reinvented as a molecule elsewhere. You don't need to. There are other molecules. I mean, they're even the things that use the hot sulfur under the ocean, they have other ways of taking energy and putting it into complex molecules that doesn't involve chlorophyll. Even on the surface of the earth, there are trees where the leaves are red, not green. But the molecules that you just talked about all had a common ancestor. You may well be right. I wasn't there. Okay. Um, what you're saying is they have a common structure, which is most easily explained if one developed from another. That's right. They could Which is also, often the case in Well, biology. yeah, indeed, but of course there is also convergent evolution. Right, well Bats that's an issue. Bats and pterosaurs I'm, and birds all have wings, but they didn't, know. they're that's not. That's an issue, well, I'm gonna interview Simon Conway Morris about that. Oh yeah, he's, he's, he's a great guy. I've, I've been on a panel discuss, discussion with him many uh, years ago. Uh -huh. He was the one with the picture of the degree yes. granting ceremony yes. with the dinosaurs. Yes. And what, last time I was in Cambridge, or last time but one, I actually spent some time in his family with his wife, and they lead a very austere life in some ways. They have wonderful wine, but no car. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. He also loves reading books, and he says picking his nose and, and reading books. <laughs> His so. favorite activities. Okay, maybe they maybe they're better together than separately. I'm not sure. How about in the, the you've seen the movie Contact? I have not. You haven't. No. Have you read the book? No. Why not? There are only so many hours in the day. I see. So you're not a big fan of Carl Sagan. Many of us got into this business by reading Carl Sagan books. I did not. I'm just enough older than you that they didn't exist. I mean, the, the Gamow, our friend the Sun existed, and some of the early Fred Hoyles, but science was not something I particularly enjoyed or wanted to do. I landed there pretty much by accident. Really? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, I went to UCLA because it was close to home and cheap, and I needed to stay in Hollywood because I was still earning my keep doing voiceovers and crowd scenes and things like that. I needed to stay close to Hollywood. And UCLA was there, close and cheap, and 
I wanted to be an Egyptologist. An anthropologist? No, an Egyptologist. An Egyptologist. And my first published paper is actually in Egyptology. Really? But they didn't have an undergraduate archaeology major. You were supposed to do undergraduate anthropology and then graduate archaeology. But undergraduate anthropology meant four years of the marriage customs of the Yangna Indians, roughly. <laughs> and that didn't appeal to me. And my father sort of looked through the UCLA catalog. In those days, you had to declare a major before you came. Oh. They, didn't, they don't do that. Now, we have juniors who still don't know what they're doing. Yes but they're going to be doing it for a long time. No, you had to pick a major. And so father started at the beginning of the catalog, and art was clearly not a good choice. Uh, my drawings are remarkably bad. And he said, oh, you've always been interested in astronomy. I didn't know this. My father said I had. <laughs> my uncle Roy was a serious amateur astronomer, and we used to have to look through his telescope. But because I was very, very nearsighted, uh -huh. and nobody knew what the problem was, I never saw anything but a blur through his telescope. Oh. So astronomy was something unpleasant. You had to go out on a dark, cold night, <laughs> uh -huh. look at the sky, look at this blur. But astronomy turned out well. I started out in astronomy math, which was really orbit computation, and moved into astronomy physics mm -hmm. when uh, astronomy math became engineering. So I ended up with a joint physics and astronomy degrees. And graduate school, well, I had my own money. I got a, a, a Woodrow Wilson fellowship that would cover the first year. And I couldn't stay at UCLA with that. I had to go someplace else. And Uncle, Uncle George Abel of the Abel Catalog uh -huh. said, well, you should go, said George, to his alma mater, which was Caltech. He didn't tell me they didn't take women. Oh. So I simply applied. Later, I discovered the, ca the catalog said women are admitted only under exceptional circumstances. They had about 14 who'd come in package deals with husbands who had come with faculty members who'd moved from some other university. And the very first one, they accepted by accident because they didn't know that a Japanese with a name ending in K.O. was going to be a young lady. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it means grace or I, I don't know what it means. It means spring or grace or something. It's definitely a woman's name. Yes. And many Japanese women's names do end with the syllable ko. Yes. Anyway, um, I applied for admission. I explained that I had the fellowship that required me to leave UCLA. And Caltech was the only other astronomy program nearby. Uh -huh. I didn't claim that it was prestigious because I didn't know that. Uh -huh. It was prestigious even then, perhaps less so than now, but I got a letter that said, Dear Ms. Trimble, we've reviewed your qualifications. On the basis of them, we conclude we cannot deny you admission to the California <laughs> Institute of Technology, but we think you might be happier elsewhere. Wow. No, mother said, just ignore that sentence. <laughs> and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. All these lovely men. Um, <laughs> and, and Feynman was there, right? Yeah, well, I modeled for him when he was learning to draw. Uh -huh. So there are probably a dozen pictures of me unclothed from various angles. <laughs> I have one at home, and there are others have been on exhibit. Any good? Is it his drawing? Yes. Uh, his sil silver point was very good. His colors were not. But um, there was a display of his things after he died at Caltech, and Joe and I were there for something else, and we walked through the gallery, and Joe says, I've seen that back before. <laughs> this is Joe Weber, my husband. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, his drawings were very good. He, di he never succeeded in teaching Jerry Zorthian any physics, which was supposed to be the quid pro quo and his colors were poor, just as he had a great sense of rhythm and not much sense of melody. Oh. But I know a counterexample there, too. Someone else who did really good line drawings was hopeless with color, oh. but also had a great sense of melody. His name was Enrico Caruso. Oh, <laughs> one, one of my absolute heroes. Okay. I'm sorry, I died 20 years, to, to 22 years. I, he died 22 years before I was born. So that's how you got into astronomy at Caltech. Yeah. And then what about the... Uh, you're interested in the question, are we alone? How did that question become? Oh, I'm in only moderately interested. I mean, um, our generation had the Sklovsky and Sagan book, which actually in its day was a superb introduction to the universe, stars, planets, and on beyond to biology. Yes. And I had to start teaching at Irvine, fairly young, and they asked me to create a course for non-majors, and I said, well, why don't I teach life in the universe? I didn't call it that. I called it Cosmology, Man's Place in the Universe, uh -huh. with Skrofsky and Sagan as the text. And in the intervening 45 years, um, intelligent extraterrestrial life has been in and out of fashion at least half a dozen times. It was totally out in the 80s, and I think it's back in now, but there have been real fluctuations in how many people were prepared to take it seriously, sometimes driven by things like the discovery of lots of exoplanets, sometimes driven by improvements in laboratory synthesis of complex molecules, 
My father was a good chemist, quite a good chemist, or rather poor businessman. Uh -huh. um, and so I've kept that topic as a talk that I give in the public. I've given that talk more than 200 times. I can no longer do it stone cold sober. <laughs> and the four possible conclusions haven't changed. The meaning of the fine tuning that allows us to be here, okay, God has been very careful. It may be right, but it's not useful. Um, more physics, when we learn to calculate things better, we will understand why G has the value it does in the Hubble constant. Um, multiverses and multiple universes was one of my thoughts when I first gave this talk 40 years ago. Um, and sheer complexity. If you had lots of forces and lots of particles, maybe they don't need any specific properties. I think you really do need three spatial dimensions in one time, mm -hmm. or you end up with things that we don't know how to discuss. So what subset of the multiverse has those characteristics? Well, that's, of course, anthropic again. And one claim is that you go through all this and you only believe the answer if the answer is that our universe is one of the more likely ones in a multiverse complex. I'm not sure I believe that. Although I was just in a session talking about solar minimum and is the sun, how unusual is the Maunder minimum? Do other stars do that? Mm -hmm. The answer is some do, but not very many. And that's another one we might look at, for, along with plate tectonics and uh, other things about the Earth and the sun that might be important. Again, not for biological life even necessarily, but for the kind of intelligence that can do first radio astronomy and then communicate with neutrinos. So you're looking for something that might be unique or rare among stars and the Earth and, and planets? Well, we are somewhat rare, at least in the solar neighborhood. And in what sense? Um, well, there are thousands of planets, and so far none of them is quite uh, Earth mass, Earth period, solar par parent. But a large fraction of that is the selection effects associated with it. Much of it is selection effects, although um, Kepler is now reaching very close there. Mm -hmm. And if Kepler II doesn't find something, that number in the Drake equation goes down a bit. Not to zero, but it goes down. Um, we don't know what all might be special about the sun. Its age is not unusual, its composition is not. The arrangement of our planets is quite unusual. And maybe having a Jupiter out there is important. You know, it shields us from, from impacts of okay. asteroid belt stuff. Have, um, have, you, have you ever seen a UFO? I've seen many things in the sky that I didn't know what they were. I did not suppose that any of them was a spacecraft from another civilization. They used to launch lots of things from Vandenberg, and I live, oh, 50 miles south or something. Every time they launched something from Vandenberg, there were lots of UFO reports. Uh-huh, right, and, but have you seen something, what was the most convincing thing that, hey, I really don't know what that is. It's not Venus, it's not the moon, all the things I can think of, it's not so. Oh, they're, they're short-lived things that turn out to be ice crystal patterns. <clears throat> you know, like Ezekiel saw the wheel, uh -huh. and bolides which perhaps that's what uh, Constantine saw that turned the Turkish Empire, it wasn't Turkish in those days, but turned the Ottoman Empire, the Byzantine Empire Christian. I see. Um, How about, uh, some people say, oh, there was a light that followed me for 20 minutes. What, have you run into, I, I ran would, into I would call the police, frankly, <laughs> because it's probably a stalker. <laughs> but it was okay, lights that seem to follow you, it's because they're a long ways away. I see. And you, you assume you know the distance. Yes. Occasionally, it's just an airplane that's going the same direction you are, much further away, and to the same angular velocity. Um, and there are people who say things have landed in their yards and taken them for rides. These people generally have other problems as well. <laughs> How about uh, you've never been abducted by an aliens, for example? No, I have not. Uh, <laughs> I've never even really been abducted by human beings, so there were some close calls. <laughs> So, but you've met people who have claimed that they have been abducted. I have not, um, but I make some effort. I always tell the students at the beginning of any of these large, non-major classes, I have spent all of my life on Earth. I think most of you have also spent all of your life on Earth. If somebody feels differently, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> wait, 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 can you explain that? Uh, people who think they've been abducted like other kinds of unusual ideas can be kind of tiresome about it. And you know, I'm not that full of the milk of human kindness or they wouldn't have taken me at Caltech. <laughs> so you're saying that they're so impressed by their experience they want to 
they need to talk about it and they need some type of reassurance that they're not crazy and so you're saying yes. you, you will not listen you're not one well, of the people who will listen i'm not one of the people i'm, I'm not going to reassure them that they're not crazy i see i mean I, I'll, I mean any astronomer will tell you that they've seen things in the sky they don't understand yes and you know a lot of them oh noctilucent clouds is another one and i've been puzzled for years why the u.s government is interested in noctilucent clouds but the only people who know aren't allowed to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about Area 51? Uh, do you, have you been there? Would you want to go there? You, or is it, you, don't, it? you don't mean Captain Selected Area, I guess. You mean something else. I, I, I've just heard alien uh, aficionados talk about uh, Area 51 and uh, aliens and bodies and autopsies. and uh, you've never, I mean, I've never even heard of it. Oh, okay. Well, Area 51, I think, is associated with, hey, in 1949, uh, there was an alien ship that the government found, and they're not telling us about it. Conspiracy theory. Oh, is this theory. Roswell? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Roswell I know about. Oh, tell um, us about Roswell. <laughs> what do you know about Roswell? It was not, not, not unexpectedly an early government experiment that fell down in the wrong place. Uh -huh. And it was carrying things that looked like small human beings because they wanted to test what would get broken up if it crashed. Oh, I had never heard that. Well, that's what I have heard from people who... The people who absolutely know, well, they're all dead now, of course, but secondhand from people who probably knew, it was what Sterling Colgate would have told you, that it was a government experiment that went slightly wrong. And that was his part of the world, of course, uh -huh. because he grew up very near Los Alamos. And who is this? Sterling Colgate. Sterling Colgate, okay. You know, he had a th supernova theory and many other interesting science ideas. I so, so this spacecraft that went wrong uh, had some... It was, a, it was actually a very high flying balloon launch. A high-flying balloon launch that popped or something, or I don't know. You don't know. It wasn't somebody shot an arrow at it. It was but, too high. But, but it did have some humanoid. It was uh, carrying humanoid uh, <laughs> figures to test damages. Same as when you test automobiles in right. Detroit, I they see. crash the cars with mannequins in them. So they must have used probably the same mannequins. In that. I think they were smaller, just because the balloon had limited launch capacity oh, to go as high as they wanted really? to go. That's, and you heard this from Sterling Colgate, or? Well, I've heard it from several different people, uh -huh. and right. it was he was one of them. But um, I've read it places as well. So, what are the most most common misconceptions that people have in their heads when they try to think about the question, "Are we alone?" They either think it's terribly important or terribly unimportant. I think it's somewhere in the middle. Huh? Why? Um, we are unlikely to learn anything from them. We're also very unlikely to be at any danger from them. The people who wanted to hold off on them sending the radio message to a globular cluster simply didn't understand the distance scales. <laughs> well, Stephen Hawking uh, is yes, one of them. Yes, he's one of them, and he should know better. But he, of course, is one of the moving spirits of this breakthroughs thing. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, our record with less advanced civilizations on Hawaii or any place else has not been a good one, as we all know. Mm -hmm. um, but anything that's likely to be dangerous is not very likely to be interested in us sufficiently to come here. I mean, what, what use are we? Um, I don't think we would even make very good pets. They would need to do a good deal of redesigning before we would be a, an attractive pet for a robotic alien. <laughs> well, now you've given some thought about uh, the uh, becoming inorganic life, and what about, could you speculate a little bit more about what would happen, let's say you're in, let's say in a thousand years, uh, life, the most advanced life form is a bunch of Googles and the internet uh, consciousness or something. What would come after that, though? I mean, presumably there would be quick evolution there into something else. Can you imagine what that might be? No, no. <laughs> but you didn't ask the question until just now. Right. I mean, this issue of recreating biological life I thought about yesterday. I see. So it's not a brand new idea anymore. Uh. I, well, okay, let me say this. Something, this came up before we were plugged in. Biology has one advantage over current silicon-based devices. We don't mind getting wet. We, don't mind getting wet. So we dry off in a way that um, the laptop will not. Right. And I don't read the newspaper on a laptop at breakfast because I find strawberry jam is very bad for the laptop. It and is. it doesn't hurt the newspaper right. or my hands. Right. <laughs> Right. So and, uh, you're a little bit of a luddite. Think there are advantages to ways, not, not, not depending as on yeah. so much on it. Mm -hmm. on, on the other devices. hand, if I had a time machine, I would love to get sound recordings of Chopin and Liszt playing their own piano compositions. I would mm -hmm. love to know what they sounded like. Uh, many musicians will say they don't want to know. I would love to know that. 
How about the question of uh, religion and aliens? Uh, would, well, I'm going to ask some priests and some imams and some rabbis what they consider to be I mean, astrobiology is a... There's a, a book with a whole chapter on that. It's not a very good book. It's by Victor Stenger, and it's called God in the Multiverse. Yes. And he did a survey of some thousands of people, whether they cared one way or the other. And the short answer is that most of the intellectually developed religions have already come to terms with non-uniqueness and did long ago. There's a lovely poem. I don't remember it. Chris Corbelly could recite it for you. He's a Jesuit astronomer. Um, it's about meeting aliens and asking what form God took on other planets. Uh -huh. <laughs> Presumably the form of the aliens that are creating well, yes, them. Yes, almost <laughs> certainly. Um, I'm a third generation atheist. I am at some low level a practicing Jew as a convert and I'm moderately knowledgeable about some aspects of theology. Mm -hmm. I like complicated systems. <laughs> uh -huh. Jewish theology is one of the winners in that territory. I see. But what does that have to? But human, I would have thought that human uniqueness is an important part of most religions. You're saying, well, no, the advanced well, religions have gotten away from that. Well, maybe that's my definition of advanced. But this survey, and it was not a good one. It was not clear who the people were who were selected, or who responded, and who didn't. But very few of the people were themselves feeling they would be disturbed by other intelligent life. Some of them said that other members of their sect might be disturbed, which is, but they themselves being more intelligent would not. <laughs> that isn't quite true, but it comes pretty close. Um, but most of them felt it would not disrupt their faith very much. There were a few who said, I would simply give up. I would refuse to read science, or I would kill myself, or I would refuse to be a believer anymore. And that was rare. It was more likely they would refuse to read about science or they'd kill themselves or something. So they might fall into the, your categorization of people who think the question, are we alone, is more important than it should be. Well, they, they're sure they know the answer, that we're, we are unique, we are alone. Oh, I see, because their religion tells their them Their religion that, tells I them see. that. I see. And how, you said that this question is often interpreted as too important or not important enough. How about well, I think... I think various SETI projects make sense. I mean, the, the guy who was handing out the, the Lemon Award who canceled government funding for SETI, I think he was wrong. It's worth some tiny fraction of our GNP to at least look the easy ways and keep our eyes and ears open for something that maybe they have sent or are communicating or trying to do something. Maybe we are a target, maybe we're just in the way of a message beam but I think some low-level search makes sense. Well, let's say that you were Yuri Milner and you had $100 million and you wanted, and it was, you could have this money if you decide how to spend it on trying to answer the question, are we alone? How would you distribute the funds? I can't imagine being Yuri Milner. <laughs> I mean, because I'm a widow. Okay, let's just give you $100 million. Forget about being okay, Gary no, Miller, I, but no, I'll okay, give you $100 no, million dollars as long okay. as you spend it on, on trying to answer the question, are we alone? And I'm not allowed to provide safe drinking water in sub-Saharan Africa as an alternative? Uh, is that going to help us answer the question, are we alone? If it is, then it, yes. It might. I mean, maybe we are pariahs. They're not contacting us because we've behaved so badly on our own planet. That's a suggestion uh, that's been made, of course. I that we, we are a, We're a zoo or a prison. So the good guys of the universe are so moral that they aren't, won't talk to us because we're immoral. I wouldn't have called it moral. I've just said badly behaved. <laughs> and more moral and ethical are, are they're two emotionally charged words. Okay. I mean, it seems to me self-evident that every human being would like everybody to be halfway decently fed and housed and clothed. If you don't want that, you're not human. <laughs> but it's and not surely the aliens would feel the same. But it's not, surely it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, the idea of investing in blue sky research is something that's paid off in many ways to... Uh, well, I said I would want some money to go to this, but not my whole hundred million. Okay, how much would you go to... One percent. One percent, okay. And, and that's roughly what he's doing, too, I think. <laughs> oh, one percent would go to... And so 99 million would go to making the world a better place for human beings. And uh, perhaps Reducing a the better, Gini Index. A better, or maybe the Gini Index, maybe other things. Um, but something that would make us more attractive to aliens, okay. that wouldn't be the primary purpose. So it's kind of like I think, sprucing I think up, you're you trying would. to make yourself better looking so the aliens will ask you out on a date or something. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, you want to sell a house, you generally 
he at least vacuumed the living room. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's well known. So you would, you would use 99% of this money to vacuum the living room, make the earth a better place and more moral so that the alien would be worth well, contacting. Okay. Let me say, I think, not just the 100 million, but of our GNP, I might put 1% okay. into this kind of thing. So, and okay, so where, how would you distribute that 1%? Whatever is left, what would you do with it? Well, a lot of it should be going into making sure that our own people have decent homes and No, but that's the 99% I thought. Oh, okay, you mean, you mean the, the 1%. one percent. Well, tell me about the 1%. Um, would I hand it to Steve Hawking? No. <laughs> <laughs> or Jeff Marcy. Marcy comes a little closer. I see. Okay. Um, I, well, obviously, if this were a serious question, I would want to think about it. Okay. Um, in my husband thought that advanced civilization probably communicated using neutrinos. Uh-huh. And developing neutrino technology has many purposes, but that might be one of them, mm -hmm. to look for patterned signatures in neutrino arrival times. Right, for example, we're looking, at, we, we like to, to communicate with radio, with electromagnetic radiation that can go through air and even wet air and even clouds, and so yes. neutrinos can go through all these other yeah. objects. And, and so, so you, need, you need a big chunk of something to be a detector, but if you're advanced enough, you've got pieces of neutron star material, you don't keep them in your home closet, because uh -huh. they're awkward at home. Oh, is that the best neutrino detector you need, in the well, universe? You, you need a lot of mass, and you want to have good angular resolution, so you don't want your detector to be the size of the whole planet. Right, right. And you need to have directional information. That means you probably put gadolinium in your neutron star. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, that's what they're going to do with the water Cherenkov detectors. It'll give you one, one more neutrino flavor. So you're betting on, so you think if there are that's aliens... The, uh, that wouldn't be the only thing I would do. That, that'd okay. be one thing I would pay more attention to. How about gravity waves? Well, you understand, I was married to Joe Weber for 28 and a half years. Yes. And do I think LIGO is going to find anything? <laughs> that may not show on your camera. <clears throat> I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it. Because? Because there was something that was affecting the bar detectors, not just his, but the one in Japan and the one in Italy at the time of Supernova 1987A, which suggests that there's some small component which is not just GR gravitational radiation. It might, not quite brand sticky, but something sort of Tevish ish Tevish. Uh, tensor vector scalar. I see. But some piece of gravitational radiation that actually did affect those detectors. So would you invest in bar detectors? Would I invest in a better, bigger, bigger, better bar detectors? I might. Oh. I mean, not the whole chunk, but something. How about uh, micro nano aliens? Would you invest in electron microscopy to look for nano aliens or? I don't think you need to. I think other people are doing that for other reasons. Uh -huh. And if one of these days, <coughs> one of those little pools of, of DNA <coughs> pulls out a sign that says, hello, <laughs> I don't need to have funded that to make okay. it happen. Any, anything else you can think of? Uh, well, the radio makes sense. Radio. And optical. And looking for type two civilizations a little more seriously. And and for, just to remind the audience, that would be infrared surveys? or Infra Infrared, well, the surveys are happening, of course, but looking for a signature in the data that are already there or are being collected for other purposes. Um, the but wouldn't that be a black body infrared? Well, if you reject, if you reject nothing but heat, it's a it would be a perfect black body, and no infrared source is a perfect black body. Uh -huh. But if you're rejecting junk as well as heat, you might well look for radioactivity they wanted to get rid of, or some complex poisonous molecules they wanted to get rid of. Mm -hmm. There might be things other than just the black body. If you were looking for a class three that's a whole galaxy, well, there's still CTA 102. How about the equivalent, I don't know what that is, CTA 102? That was the radio source that seemed to be periodic in 1965, at the time when there was a SETI conference going on. And the concluding remark, somebody says, well, apparently someone was trying to contact one of the participants. <laughs> okay. it, as a Russian result, it was talked about in the meeting yesterday on nice. historical radio astronomy. How about the idea of a stellar equivalent of an Oklo reaction? In other words, if there's a, a civilization, they're using up all this radioactivity much faster because they've put everything into a reactor, and then it somehow gets dumped into their home star, <coughs> excuse mm -hmm. me, then we would see anomalous mm -hmm. uh, uh, isotopic and, ratios. Yeah, well, you'd see anomalous chemical composition, perhaps more easily. <coughs> and in order to make this work, you've got to look at stars that don't have deep convective envelopes. 
And if you're thinking Earth-like life, you want stars like the sun that do have, you have to put an awful lot of stuff into the sun to make any difference at all. Whereas stars that, oh, well, okay, stars that might have had life in the past and maybe it's clinging on, white dwarfs, their surfaces are almost totally non-convective. Uh -huh. And there are ones with chemical, many of them, with chemical anomalies that are probably debris disks being accreted. Right. Or debris disks is what you make when you break up your planet. So for example, let's suppose that we use up all the uranium and plutonium and any other radioactive element on this planet and then we quickly burn it into something else, get the energy and then we go to another planet that debris that we left, I'm not sure whether it would be a big enough signal on the remaining white dwarf that the sun will turn into. On a white dwarf it might be, on the sun at present it would not. I see. Because the sun mixes down, you know, 10% or more of its mass in the convective envelope. But the white dwarfs do show some of the anomalies in carbon and oxygen and well, iron, in, iron in particular, which is not the most abundant well, element Presumably the, the, the Earth would possibly be engulfed when the sun turns into a red giant, and that would be Maybe, maybe mixed. not, actually, because yeah, it will right. lose mass, the Earth will move right, out. Right, 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 right. Venus will not survive the Earth mind. Right, okay. And uh, do you think uh, the universe is getting more complex with time in violation of the second law? No, because it's not a closed system. It's not a closed system. The universe is not a closed system. It's not a closed system in the sense, well, of course, the Earth, we know, can get more complex because we have high quality energy coming from the sun. Yes, yes. So life developing but here doesn't violate anything. No. Um, <clears throat> if you go to GR and ask to define global quantities, even the total energy of the universe is not brilliantly well defined. And I think the entropy isn't either. But there's an awful lot of space in which to dump extra entropy. But surely you wouldn't say that uh, because it's poorly defined, that doesn't mean we, that, that it somehow violates the second law. I'm not sure you can specify the second law. If you have quantities that you can't assign numerical values to, your equation may not be a very useful one. I may be wrong about that. But again, there's also an awful lot of empty space in which to dump entropy. And if you turned all the, okay, this, this is a real number. You turn all the matter, all the baryons in the universe into radiation with 100% efficiency, what radiation temperature you, do, do you get? Do you make the sky blaze like the sun? No, you get 20 Kelvin. And so if all you ever did was to turn all the hydrogen into helium and all the uranium and thorium down to lead, it would affect the temperature of the universe very, very little. And that's at the current time. Earlier on, that would be different, I imagine. Uh, it would be worse early on because you lose temperature as z to the fourth and not z cubed. Right. You lose matter as z cubed. You yes. lose radiation yeah. intensity, right. energy density as z so to the fourth. So if you turned all the baryons into, uh, let's say the baryon asymmetry was zero, the temperature would now would be much colder. No, if you turned all the baryons into, well, when, when it happened, I mean, when the baryon asymmetry disappeared or appeared, um, it produced temperatures of 10 to the nine or something. If it had disappeared completely, it would have been 10 to the 9.1 or, you know, some small number. And oh, if the universe continued to right, expand, it would still be four, 3 Kelvin now. Right, right. But okay. nobody would know what now meant because we wouldn't be here to talk about <laughs> yeah, it. That's right. Okay. And how about advice for students? Now, you know, you've uh, taught students about astrobiology and life in the universe. And what advice did you give your students about how to think about this issue? I didn't much. Um, in recent years, it's turned out many of them don't want that. And my one unit freshman seminar that I did Life in the Universe for a number of years, I've switched over to black holes, which they find more interesting, <laughs> with Beagleman and Reese as the text. Um, I don't know how I should think about things. I'm not going to advise anybody else. One ad piece of advice I would give students, and this is serious, don't worry about your, your blinking passion. Find something you're good at and do it. <laughs> Find something you're good enough at, you can earn your keep, and you can do other things with, your, with other time. I mean, I'm a graduate of Hollywood High School, and we were all expected to sing and dance. I can do a hula if you want. Um, well, we're all expected to sing and dance and play musical instruments and act. And some of my classmates made that their careers. Some of them, very few of them did well, a few. But um, it was obvious to me very early, it was going to be easier to be a professional scientist and an amateur musician than the other way around. <laughs> All right, so don't follow your passion, follow your skills then. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that puts it pretty starkly, but find something you're good at and, and do it, and do it well. 
and I think that affects choosing a major as well. Don't make a big fuss over it. Just find something you can finish up and finish, and then go out into the world. It gives you more choices. <laughs> but that would seem to make you end up doing things that you might not want to do, you don't, you're not passionate about. <laughs> there are days when I'm passionate about is sleeping. <laughs> no, it, if you're good at something, you generally become quite fond of it. You may well be equally fond of other things. I'm still fascinated by languages. Mm -hmm. And the one art, the, uh, the surfboard we were supposed to sign in the exhibit hall, yes. the one autograph that's in hieroglyphs is mine. Oh, in hieroglyphs? Yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, I did a year of Egyptology and a year of hieroglyphs. Right. And I still find languages very interesting. Uh, that's, so you're in, how about the idea of, well, since you're interested in language, how about the idea of the possible ambiguity of a signal? For example, uh, in, in, the movie, in the movie Contact and the book Contact, Carl Sagan used the random digits of pi and, uh, and said that, well, since they're random, they can't be compressed and they contain every message that you could ever think of. And so the idea of somehow, I guess, is that some alien god created the universe and therefore created what those digits were, and therefore uh, that's a signal for us to be able to read or something. What do you think of that? If I were sending it as a signal, I would not send it as an infinite stream. I would send the first 200 digits of pi or something <laughs> like that. I see. So if time they, is if money. They don't, <laughs> if they don't recognize it by now, they're never going to get it. I see. All right. So how about the ambiguity of artificial versus natural. I mean, that seems oh, to be a... Oh, perfectly possible. I mean, when, when they called pulsars little green men, it was two-thirds joke and one-third possibly true. And when they recognized that there was no pattern except the regular pulses and that the amplitude variations were just interstellar, interplanetary scintillation, mm -hmm. then it became clear that the pattern that was there was a natural one. And nobody would deliberately send out a pulsar signal and make it look like interstellar scintillation. <laughs> okay. And um, last question is, uh, are we alone? I don't know. I think on the scale of an infinite universe or on multiverses, surely there are other places where some small fraction of the particles control a very large number of particles. And that's the broadest definition I can think of just at the moment for intelligent life. We're a small fraction of the baryons, even on Earth, and yet we control a lot of baryons on Earth and a few on the Moon and some on Mars, and that, that number will grow. So someplace where a few baryons control a lot, I think there are other places in our universe and certainly in multiverses. We may not be able to communicate with them. It's another issue. Well, thank you very much. No, thank you. You never let me talk about choirs. <laughs> <laughs> choirs? That's what I do. You want to talk about choirs? Oh, well, I've always sung in choirs, starting, you know, from grammar school. Oh, is that right? Can you sing us a little song? The Hara Kevet, hey, me still blevet, ha ga ga lil, ha ga ga lil, ha ga ga lil. That's a children's song in Israel. Uh -huh. It's about a train running on and on and on. <laughs> I see. Really? And you sing in the choir at Irvine or something? I sang in the university chorus until the director decided he didn't like me. I've sung in synagogue choirs for many years, oh. long before I was Jewish. Right. And so when I went to convert, they didn't know I wasn't Jewish. There was some sorting out, but it was all right. <laughs> but I've, I've sung in synagogue choirs. I've sung in Catholic choirs as well. That's fun, or it used to be, when the Mass was in, was in Latin, because you got a new Mass every week, and oh. you, you practiced Tuesday night, and you sang, I'm lying, you practiced Wednesday night, and sang Sunday morning. <laughs> Do you have a favorite song from those, that time? That's part of a Requiem Mass uh -huh. in the Gregorian chant. And that's in Latin? Yes. Die Sire, God of wrath. Die Sire, God of this day. Solvet seclum in favilla. Save us from the times. Okay, so you just sang a, a Latin song and a Hebrew song? Mm -hmm. You don't know any other language songs? <laughs> Du, du, leaks mir im Herzen, du, du, leaks mir im Sinn, du. That's German. <laughs> My father taught me that one. Um, <laughs> Sol mare I started too low. Sol mare lucica, lastro d'argento. That's Italian. I know it all the way through. Oh. Um, Suave en la fuente, bria la luna de azur. That's Spanish. I know it all the way through. <laughs> um, 
Au clair de la luna, mon ami Piero. That was the very first song ever recorded, long before Edison. Really? That's that scratched carbon film that somebody found in the Smithsonian, and they've, re they've read the grooves using a pattern recognition program and turned it into sound waves again. Wow. And so that was the very first song ever recorded. And what's that song called? Is it? Au clair de la luna, mon ami Piero. Ah, mon ami Piero, prête moi ta plume pour écrire un mot. Ma chante de mes mortes, je n'ai plus de feu. Offre-moi ta porte, je ferai moi de Dieu. That's great. And then Pierre responds, go to the neighbor, I see her fire is burning. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Au clair de la luna, Piero répondit, je n'ai pas de fume, je fais dans mon lit. Okay, yes. <laughs> we know two verses. All right, very good. <laughs> okay. That's excellent. Um, uh, maybe that'll help us uh, talk to the aliens. Uh, um, maybe she'll get a linguist. You didn't mention about investing in any linguist to help us uh, decode signals. They're already involved. Are they? Some, yeah. Um, they could do with being paid better, yes. I, that's fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with that for sure. Um, you didn't happen to know Greenberg, did you? The linguist Greenberg, who did phylogenetic trees of languages at Stanford, and he's got a student, Merritt Rulin. They're the ones who have found just three families in North America? I think that's right. That's okay. Right. I guys. have not met them. I certainly know some of the work, and I subscribe to the view that the, the speakers of Indo-European came from, from the Ukraine, roughly, uh -huh. because uh -huh. they had horses. So and horses bits. That would be, be 7,000 years ago? or some Maybe a little longer, but that sort of number, yeah. Oh. Um, and yes, I think Hamitic and Sem Semitic languages are related because the structure of ancient Egyptian is so much like Hebrew. They have these triliteral verb roots. So what, what was that? Uh, a verb root, a basic one, has three consonants. And you decorate it with vowels to make the tenses and the persons and what we would call moods and modes, subjunctive and stuff like that. Oh. And the prototype, when you learn ancient Egyptian, when you learn Latin, you learn amo, amas, amat, right? Yes, yes. Amamas, amatas, amat, yes, okay. When you learn Egyptian, you learn sejum f. Uh, that's he hears. The S J M is he hears. If you ask a Jew for the beginning of a well known prayer, Shema, hear, O Israel. Shema and sejum are clearly the same word, also expressed as three verbs. And you decorate with vowels, three uh, consonants, you decorate with vowels to make tenses and people. Oh, decorate. Well, that's the wrong word. <laughs> but it's the word I used. Well, so you, said you have a very broad range of interests. And, uh, you know, the idea that right now, I think Margaret Mead, who is living in the South Pacific, yes. would wake up and say, I'm doing something valuable. I am going out and recording a language which I know is dying out. And maybe before I die, it will die. So the whole idea of human cultures dying out and losing all that richness was and something we, that was very important to her. We lose one a week or something like it, many of them in New Guinea, where she was, but also American Indian languages. There are only about a dozen that have hundreds of young native speakers, Navajo, of course, and Cherokee and a few others. But we're losing an Indian language, you know, one a week or something. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what was true long ago, New Guinea may have had more languages than any place else, certainly for the area it did. But North America came a close second. Mm -hmm. Isolated tribes whose languages diverged very quickly. Mm. And to have been able to trace that back to, to three languages, I think is very impressive if it's true.